Behold, an invitation to wonder by Justin Hoffman. Chapter 6 Living to Tell the Good News, narrated by Jacob Daniel. Chapter 6 Living to Tell the Good News. In the previous chapter, we concluded with the great commission of Jesus to his church. It is a perfectly worded commission. It tells us not only what we are supposed to do, but how we are supposed to do it. Jesus encourages his disciples in every age to ponder the power of his presence with them as they go to the nations in his name. Now we know the purpose of our existence. How exciting! People around the world in every age wonder, why am I here? What is the meaning of life? Now we know because Jesus tells us. We exist for the glory of God. We exist to spread the fame of Jesus Christ. Why do we have the health or mind or marriage or financial situation in which we find ourselves? Whatever God gives us is meant to terminate in his glory, not our own pleasure. God works in our lives to the end that the resources we steward will be used for the glory of his name. Because we really do believe that Jesus died for our sins, rose from the dead, and is even now fueling the mission of his church. Whenever we go to the grocery store or to Ghana, we go in his name. We might well wonder, however, what a great commission life looks like. What does it look like in our own lives personally? What does it look like in our church, corporately? What does it look like in real-world situations where our gospel witness is often received, not with ready arms, but with opposition? Sympathetic to our plight, God provides us another inspired history in addition to the gospels, which tell us about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. This divine account of the earlier church is commonly called the Acts of the Apostles, and it is carefully researched and recounted story, the living in front of us example of how the early church sought to fulfill the Great Commission. It is written by Luke the physician, a companion of the apostles themselves. There is no better way to behold what the Great Commission life looks like. We see it all begin in the first chapter of Acts, as the resurrected Jesus makes his final in-person appearance to his disciples. The disciples, though greatly encouraged by Jesus' resurrection, were still confused about the plan going forward. Was Jesus now going to finally set up his kingdom on earth as they expected him to do before his death? It had not yet dawned on them that they are the kingdom of Christ in this world. Jesus meets with his disciples one last time and he informs them that they will be his witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and then spreading to the ends of the earth. The disciples have been asking Jesus, both before his death and after his resurrection, when are you going to do your job as Messiah and set up your kingdom? But Jesus lets them know, that's your job. You are my witnesses. And immediately after telling him this, he leaves. He ascends into heaven, disappearing behind the clouds. The disciples, clearly now utterly bewildered, stand transfixed, their eyes fixed on the place they last caught a glimpse of Jesus. Luke, the narrator, grabs our attention by telling us what grabbed the apostles' attention next. And while the disciples were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand up looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him going into heaven. Acts 1, verse 10 to 11. In one hand, the answer to the angel's question seems self-evident. Why are the disciples just frozen in place and looking into the sky? They had just witnessed the unannounced ascension of Jesus. It is not every day you see the resurrected Jesus in glorified bodily form, but then you have him all of a sudden say goodbye and fly up into heaven. How would we expect someone to respond as eyewitnesses to this event? The disciples' reaction seems not only understandable, but almost inevitable. 
Yet the question of the angels, questioning of the angels, drives home a specific point. Why are you disciples still standing here when Jesus just said you have work to do? You are the witnesses of Jesus to the whole world until he comes again. The disciples get the point. In fact, this is the moment forward. They grow from boys to men. The three plus years of working with Jesus, coupled with them seeing him die and then rise from the dead, give them the strength to face insurmountable odds in his name. Suddenly, the immaturity, infighting, and short-sightedness seem to be evaporated. Though they are still far from perfect, these men now have one unifying purpose. They are witnesses of the God-man, Jesus This is the effect of knowing Jesus. Though Christians walk by faith, we walk in confidence. We know that Jesus is our Lord and that makes him worth it all. Every lesser pursuit is submitted to the one great purpose of spreading the fame of Jesus. As the apostles return home and prayerfully pursue the mission Jesus had given them, remarkable events begin to unfold with startling rapidity and results. The power of God is so on display that many of the exclamations of wonder come, not just from Christians themselves, but from the mouths of others who observe them. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes as Jesus promised helper to his church. Tongues of visible fire hover over the heads of the relatively small group of Christians. They instantly begin speaking in languages they have never known or studied. This scene is so strikingly supernatural that Luke records the reaction even of onlookers. They were so amazed and astonished, saying, Behold, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Acts 2, 7 and 8. This proves to be just the beginning of the gospel spreading. As the apostles go in response to the Savior's commission, They preach and work miracles. Believers begin multiplying exponentially throughout the Jerusalem. Multitudes of both men and women, Acts 5.14. This growth is, of course, not met with enthusiasm on the part of the Jewish leaders. They respond by throwing the apostles in prison. But this just presents yet another opportunity for Jesus to display his power throughout the early church. An angel comes at night to the apostles in jail ushers them miraculously out through locked prison doors, and then explicitly tells them to walk straight to the temple, the most public place in the city, and speak to the people all the words of his lo- of this life from Acts 5.20. The next morning then, when the chief pr- priests arrive at work, they are met with the news that their prisoners are not in prison at all. And someone came and told them, Behold! The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people from Acts 5.25. What a comical scene. It is an intentional contrast between the perceived power of men who oppose the gospel and the actual power of the spirit to enable the gospel. Like Pilate telling Jewish leaders to make the grave of Jesus as sure as you can and then hearing the next day that the tomb is empty. Here, The Jewish leaders try to shut up the apostles, only to find the next morning that the prison cell is empty and the gospel is being proclaimed in the town square. We are meant to take note of these amazing turn of events. In response to this angelic um, jailbreak, the apostles are brought back in and set in front of the Jewish council. The high priest, intending to scold them, actually pays an accidental compliment. We strictly charge you not to teach in his name, yet behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, from Acts 5.28. Though the gospel's opponents have sought to keep the gospel under wraps, the power of God has affected the exact opposite. Jerusalem has been filled with this teaching. As the church continues to grow, so do both problems and possibilities. Saul of Tarsus, the zealous Pharisee, mounts a savage persecution of the church in Jerusalem. 
However, the unintended consequence of this is scattering the Christians throughout Judea and Samaria, precisely where Jesus had already told his disciples where they would next bear witness of him. Philip, previously ordained as a deacon in the church, becomes an evangelist and proclaims the Christ in the city of Samaria. Remember how Jesus, speaking to an, a, a Samarian woman, told his disciples to look for the ripe harvest? Well, now they're seeing it. Peter and John join him, and soon villages all over the region of Samaria come to know Christ. These exciting events are followed by yet another angelic appearance, this one far less dramatic than the angel performing a a prison break. This angel simply speaks to Philip in order to give him his next marching orders. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. And he rose and went. And behold, a Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all of her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Acts 8, 26 to 28. What are the chances? An angel tells Philip to travel to a certain place. When Philip arrives, would you look at that? He is... He finds a man reading a prophecy concerning about the Messiah and wondering, who is this talking about? And so Philip is able to tell him about Jesus, baptize him on the spot, and send him on to Africa with the good news. In the very next chapter, Saul, the ultra-religious Pharisee, has become the chief adversary of the Christian church and is going to great lengths to snuff out this movement. He imprisons and tortures Christian believers, compelling them to blaspheme. But as Saul travels to Damascus to continue his campaign of terror, Jesus himself appears to him, changes his heart, and calls him to be a witness for Christ. With Jesus, wonders truly never cease. Jesus sends Saul, soon to be Paul, to a Christian in Damascus named Ananias, and then appears to Ananias, telling him to help Saul. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Acts 9.11 This religious zealot Saul, as a Pharisee, had prayed thousands of prayers without ever praying. Behold, He is only now truly praying for the first time in his life, because now he is coming to God through Jesus Christ. Everything else is just empty religion. In the following chapters, Acts 10 and 11, we encountered a pivotal point in the early church in which the gospel spreads now to the Gentiles. A godly Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius had been prayerfully pursuing God for help and direction. God answers by directing Cornelius to send men to ask the Apostle Peter for help. The problem is, Peter, although a good Christian, is still a good Jew. He considers any Gentile, a non-Jew, to be filthy and unclean. They are not even to be touched. Maybe he had stretched himself to interact with Samaritans, but that was as far as he was willing to go. Until Jesus appears to Peter in a vision. Peter sees a great sheet filled with non-kosher, unclean food. Jesus commands Peter to eat, but he refuses. Jesus rebukes Peter, telling him not to consider anything unclean that God has made clean. For good measure, the lesson is repeated three times. It may be easy for many of us today to look down on Peter. What in the world, Peter? Why would you need God to teach you this lesson? that you are not better than other people, or that other people are not unclean. But consider this, what if God told you to eat garbage? If Jesus appeared bef- appeared to you in a similar vision to Peter's and said, I know garbage smells bad, I know it tastes bad, but I have worked an amazing miracle and now garbage is going to be good for you. So go, eat garbage. Would you struggle with such a command? Wouldn't you maybe wrestle at least a little? Would you wonder if perhaps there weren't something else just as good for you? 
that, but it wouldn't smell and taste bad. This is what it was like for Peter, who for his whole life had lived clean and is now told to go and rubbish in the garbage bin. Peter couldn't imagine how it could be God's will for him to touch filthy things. What could this vision possibly mean? Peter doesn't have to wait long to find out because, again, God is plainly on the move. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who are sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. Acts ten seventeen. This was no accident. God is working on both sides to bring the gospel to the Gentiles and the Gentiles to himself. When Peter goes with the men to Cornelius' house, he shares the good news concerning Jesus. Cornelius and his entire household embrace the gospel, and the New Testament church discovers that to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Acts 11.18 Who knows what amazing doors might open for us as well if we start going out of our way and out of our comfort zones to proclaim who Jesus is and what he has done. Now, at this point, however, we might all be willing to sign up to be Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth, angels appearing to us, miracles preparing the way for us, visions followed by immediate and ready-made conversions. Sign me up for this next mission trip. Sure, we may have to spend a night in jail, but hey, that's nothing my guardian angel can't handle. But these are not not the only stories in the book of Acts. Intertwined in the very narratives we have just considered are also moments of great suffering and loss. The apostles were beaten and told to stop preaching. Stephen was stoned to death for calling people to repentance and a faith in Christ. And Saul of Tarsus harmed countless Christians before he became one himself. Soon after the Gentiles received the gospel in Acts 12, James becomes the first apostle to be martyred. In fact, history tells us 11 of the 12 remaining apostles would eventually follow him as Christian martyrs, including the apostle Paul. We are reminded that not only is life given to us for us to tell the good news concerning Jesus Christ, but it may actually cost our lives. And so Paul's own testimony in Acts 20 is a timely one. After the Apostle Paul is converted on the road to Damascus, Jesus calls him to be a minister to the Gentiles. After many travels, planting many churches throughout the Gentile world, Paul concludes his third missionary journey by returning to Jerusalem. But Paul first calls together a group of leaders from the church in Ephesus and informs them he's going to Jerusalem will, as prophesied, result in his imprisonment. His parting words to these Ephesian elders are striking to them, and they should be to us as well. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Acts 20, verse 22 to 25. Although there are numerous things to consider in Paul's passionate address, let's consider three specific lessons we should not miss. Number one, affliction awaits those who faithfully testify to the gospel. Paul admits there is much he does not know about what will happen to him in the future. Paul goes to Jerusalem not knowing exactly what that will involve, what tomorrow will hold. Yet he does know one thing for certain. He knows imprisonment and affliction await him. Paul goes on to say he knows he will not see the Ephesian elders. Dear friends, again, verse 25. And he also knows after he leaves the church at Ephesus, he will be attacked by false teachers. Verse 29. In other words, Paul knows just enough to terrify any reasonable person. Clearly, following where the Spirit leads, as Paul is doing here, may mean being content to not know tomorrow in detail. For those of us who are compulsive planners, this is all the affliction needed to make us reconsider Christian service. 
Will my family be safe if we move to the inner city to minister? How will my family react if I tell them I'm considering becoming a Christian? I mean, a real one who lives every day for, for Jesus. What if we get sick in a third world country? What if we make a big stand for Jesus that costs us dearly and we don't even see any fruit from our effort? What will it mean if my grade, for my grade if I tell my professor I disagree with what she said in the class about the Bible? What if, on one hand, we are told we are not told, and so will not know what to expect when we live publicly and shamelessly for the fame of Jesus? Our lives may be full of uncertainty. Our course will not always be char- chartable. On the other hand, like Paul. The one thing we we can be sure is that following Jesus will cost us dearly. It will mean taking up our cross daily. Paul does not work on a path of roses as he goes to Jerusalem to share the gospel. Dr. David Livingston moved to Africa in the 1800s with his family because the smoke of a thousand villages was burning in his heart. He thought of all the people in Africa who had never heard of Christ. But the day they got off the boat, his wife became ill and then died. Don't you think he wondered to himself, I need to get on the back on the boat and go back to England. What am I doing here? Affliction awaits those who testify to the gospel. But that is not all that awaits them. Yes, there is a lot of what ifs when you sign on to the Great Commission life. But there are a lot of, also a lot of promises, which leads us to our second lesson from Paul. Number two, although the cost of living for the gospel is high, it is nothing. Yes, following Jesus without reserve will mean giving up personal comfort, personal schedules, personal popularity, and personal and business ambitions. But what we get in return is the person of Jesus. Paul's great concern is following after his Lord Jesus. The fulfillment of Jesus' mission is Paul's great reward for everything he suffers. In fact, for Paul, the cost doesn't even compare to the joy. My life is not the valuable thing here. Jesus is. The reward for faithfulness of spreading the fame of Jesus is greater than the pain of every loss it may cost. This joy, this means the joy of obeying Jesus and staying with your unbelieving spouse is greater than the daily pain of enduring his or her criticisms. The joy of sacrificially giving to world missions is greater than the loss it means to your banking account. The joy of patiently waiting on God's timing and direction is greater than the immediate pleasure of just doing whatever it gets you out of your current trial. Number three. Living to testify to the gospel may not only mean pain because of its enemies, but pain because you have to leave friends. Some people, it is true, are called to Timothy-like Great Commission work, staying in one place for a long time and faithfully disciplining in one church or area. But others are called to Paul-like Great Commission work, going to new places and leaving old comfort zones in order to pursue the fame of Jesus to the ends of the earth. For me and my family, it initially meant moving eight hours away from where I grew up. That was one of the hardest years of my life. And then 16 years later, it meant us moving to another country. That was the hardest year of my life. No comfort zone is safe when we follow a crucified Savior. But even if we have to go far from a familiar territory, we will not be the first. Behold the weightiness of Paul's mission statement. It is impossible to seriously ponder his words and remain unaffected by their import. Following hard after Jesus, obeying his word and being his witnesses to the end of the world will cost us everything, but it is abundantly worth it. The joy of Jesus is greater than the pain of whatever it costs you to follow him. If you have never followed Jesus before, can you see the upside down wisdom of Jesus' kingdom? That to follow the creator of the world leads to certain joy, whereas to make a god out of this world leads to certain disappointment. Behold, not just the sorrow of Christians in the book of Acts being persecuted for their faith, but the resounding everlasting joy that echoes from their purposeful and single-minded pursuit of the Jesus Christ. 
The joy of following Jesus is one thing in all the world that is worth living for every day of your life, in every season of your life, no matter what it may cost you.